Timothy Hill. Let's hear it for him. That, that piece was written very recently, uh, like just now, okay. <laughs> so that's called an improvisation, of which Timothy is uh, a master. And so wonderful to work with him. Uh, he was one of the singers in Prana, if you ever heard Prana. Wonderful recordings. And uh, he, he'll explain what he does with his throat. It's really magical. So... I brought along a friend here I call Mr. Point, first name Power. <laughs> so I just want to explain, he's doing the overtone singing and I'm playing an instrument that's based on harmonic overtones. So there's a difference between harmonic overtones and just plain overtones. And percussion is a great instrument to demonstrate that because percussion in its raw state, like a block of wood when you hit it, it has overtones, but they're not harmonic. In order to be harmonic, they have to have a relationship. This is where I lose Diane. Of uh, ratios. <laughs> one, two, three. What comes next? Five. Five? Okay. Four, five. And that's the relationship between the frequencies or the way they vibrate. And we, I brought some instruments I made to demonstrate that and working with with uh, this master, Timothy, uh, it's so fun to hear the way it works. So what's cool about, we use an ancient tuning system, uh, in this case called just intonation, and that's where one plus one equals at least three or more. Because when you hear two notes together, they harmonize so perfectly together, they create additive notes and uh, subtractive notes and uh, different tones, 
And you'll be hearing it flying around the room. You may have heard that a little bit. Uh, sometimes you'll think there's an oboe playing or like five singers just because of the mechanics, natural mechanics of that. So Timothy, come on back and explain what you do and maybe demonstrate that. So um, the best analogy for um, how I use the voice is uh, um, a kind of refraction, like when sunlight passes through uh, moisture in the air, we see the, the colors of the rainbow, the constituent frequencies of the bl blinding white light of the sun. Um, well, what were you smoking? Right yeah, no, but it's, it's <laughs> something good. I love it. And um, so, uh, so, um, so the voice naturally uh, breaks up into different colors, as it were. So, um, and what I've learned is a way of kind of focusing the different frequencies that make up the one sound of the voice. So people often think I'm singing two notes at once, and really I'm singing one note at once. So uh, if I start, That's the natural uh, resonance of the voice. I'm not whistling and singing at the same time. The notes that you hear are all part of the one sound of the voice. And so those are, uh, this is a good time to pass it off to you, right? Thank so, you, man. So <laughs> Hard act to follow. Uh, so we're going to go to the next slide. Uh, so I thought a little background, physics background. I, when I was in college working on my master's degree, I went over to the physics department because I want to learn how percussion instruments work. And I learned from this amazing uh, physicist who uh, specialized not only in acoustics, he specialized in the acoustics of percussion instruments. Of course, he didn't make much money because nobody's interested in that. I did go there a lot and uh, I did learn how to tune instruments. So. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background. Uh, uh, there's a physicist talking about the way the string vibrates. So here we can see what's happening. I'm driving the loudspeaker with an amplifier attached to an oscillator. The volume of the amplifier determines the amplitude, so how much the woofer is moving up and down. And the oscillator I then use to determine the frequency, which is how many times per second it moves up and down. And as you saw a minute ago, the other side of the spring is attached to a clamp. I can change the frequency. This is about five hertz going up to, this is something like 10 hertz, nine hertz or so. So nine times per second going up and down. Or I could go the other way. I can go back down to five hertz. Um, that's five hertz right there. Or I can go all the way down, for example, to one hertz. So this is moving up and down and back up again one time per second. So this is the whole system again. I'm now driving it at something like 5 hertz, 5 times per second, and I'm going to increase the frequency bit by bit. This is maybe 6, 7 hertz, up to 8, 9 hertz. And suddenly you'll see when we hit 11 hertz, which I've already found out to be a magic number, um, what will happen is that the string will suddenly behave differently. This is 10 hertz and this is 11 hertz right here. So you can see now we'll freeze this. The string is in what's called its first mode of vibration. This is the frequency, 11 hertz, for this particular string in this particular setup. This is the frequency it wants to resonate at, the lowest one, this 11 hertz, so 11 times per second. What you can see is that even though we haven't changed the amplitude, the amount that the, the driver, the woofer, is moving up and down, the amount that the string is moving up and down in the middle has changed dramatically. And that's because it wants to ring at this frequency. Let's start the video again and see what happens if we increase the frequency again. So this is 11 hertz. Let's move it up. This is going up to something like 15 or 16 hertz, right? Uh, let's see, right here. So we've changed now, we're moving faster, still at the same amplitude on the woofer. Now let's go to 22 hertz and see what happens. At 22 hertz, and remember we, our first mode of vibration was 11 hertz, 
Um, at 22 hertz, you can see what we have here is the second mode of vibration. So this is the next frequency up that the string wants to vibrate at. 22 hertz is 2 times 11 hertz, so it's twice the frequency of the first mode of vibration. You can see again, I've frozen the, the video here so you can see what's going on. What's happening now is that the string naturally stops vibrating in the middle, but we still have two large uh, excursions, two points where it's moving much more than the woofer is, um, on either side of that point where it's stopped. But this happens naturally. I haven't done anything to the string to make this happen other than to put in the frequency where this mode wants to vibrate. I hope you all are taking notes. There will be a quiz later. <laughs> all right, so back in 2016, when I actually was able to memorize 13 minutes of a talk, I did this. Uh, I, I had uh, people uh, coaching me on how to do this. I had some guy in charge of TEDx uh, from Norway. We did a, a FaceTime call and uh, I went through it and he said, well, that's fine, do this, do that. So it was a lot of fun. And like I said, I got through 13 minutes with an audience of, I don't know, 700 people or something. So um, anyway, check that out if you want, but you don't have to. Anyway, this is where I got started uh, back in uh, the, early 70s, uh, when I met Diane, there's Diane sitting right there. Hey. Her, her boyfriend uh, introduced me uh, to her in the uh, slide library of the art department, and uh, for some reason she left him for me, but uh, that was a good ending. So anyway, uh, I was uh, learning how to build instruments. I was taking woodworking, metallurgy, uh, physics, and uh, I didn't have a lot of money to, uh, for materials, so I went into the landfill, we called them uh, the dump back then, and they encouraged you to shop there. Uh, so I found a pile of lawn chairs that were thrown out only because the webbing was broken, but I saw in that chair potential instruments with the aluminum tubing. And I built this thing I called the adapted lawn chair in the middle. So this is the sound of the adapted lawn chair. That was a random scale. I just cut them the length just to see what they'd sound like. I put bamboo resonators to tuned to the, the pitches above, uh, and it gave it some uh, body to the sound. Uh, but I wanted to hear what the ancient scales sounded like. That's what I was reading about. Uh, one of my mentors I'll talk about later, Harry Parch, built these enormous instruments, all based on just intonation. And uh, you, you had to, he, would play a lot of these ancient scales in his music. And he had 43 notes to his scale. Uh, and the reason he needed it, because he wanted the right five notes, all right? So anyway, here is one of the original Woodstock wind chimes that came out of that. This is a scale from seventh century ancient Greece by a flute player named Olympus. And uh, I think he probably improvised and then told stories and told the news. You know, uh, it wasn't called Fox News back then. What was it called? <laughs> I think they told the truth. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, so that's the wind chime. Here we go. This is our first showing in Cincinnati in the spring of 79. And Diane's artwork is in the background there. And uh, a, a month before that, I had made three wind chimes. And I said, Diane, can I? hang a couple in your booth at the art show, and yeah, yeah. They sold right away. Of course, we undervalued them. So uh, that's not the only reason they were sold. Uh, hopefully people like them. So that's, uh, and this is in West Hurley when we moved here. Uh, we moved here July 4th, 1979, and uh, we had a wonderful house that was just kind of renovated, an old farmhouse. Uh, in West Hurley, and uh, we had this barn that I had to kind of fix up, and this became our first factory. And then in uh, 1980, I, uh, I decided, uh, I heard that Gene Shellett was buying, he, he was a film critic on the Today Show, and he was buying uh, our chimes uh, somewhere in, near Lenox uh, at a gift store. So I wrote to him and I said, hey, 
you know, I hear you like my wind chimes. Uh, can I come on the show? <laughs> and he said, okay. So luckily, that worked out. But uh, a year before, that was 81. Uh, a year before that, I sent a wind chime to Susan Stamberg at uh, the uh, All Things Considered on NPR. And that was the early years of that show, but we used to listen to it while we were making wind chimes. So it was a thank you, and she said, oh my God, you got to come on this show. So we went down to New York, and she was in Washington, and we did this interview. Uh, we got letters saying that I was on the L.A. F uh, through freeway, that's what it's called there, and uh, I was listening, I had to pull over. I, she said I was crying, she was in tears, so maybe because I did such a bad job, I'm not sure, but uh, we got a great response from that, and it led to the Today Show, which led to uh, being in the Hallmark catalog, uh, an order for a thousand wind chimes, and we hadn't even made a hundred by then, so we had to really uh, uh, get busy. So, um, what we did through the years is we always put money back in the business. We never like took out large loans. We were very careful, very conservative. And, um, but at a certain point, I found this 19-year-old uh, kid. Uh, he was the son of friends of ours. Uh, to, and he was a genius uh, with computers. So you could imagine in 1981, 82, he was working on a Radio Shack computer and he wrote a program to do all of the uh, computer assisted operations to tune the wind chimes. And here's an explanation. Uh, he did the software and we brought together a team from MIT, a, a, a professor there brought his uh, design team and built the equipment. And here's one of three major uh, uh, devices, uh, uh, machinery. The first thing you see is the tube dropping into the milling area. Everything here is controlled by a computer. The microphone analyzes the sound of the tube and then gives this information to the computer. The computer then instructs the cutters to remove just the right amount of material in order to satisfy our very rigid standards. What results is a batch of finished tubes that may be of slightly different lengths, but are always tuned to exactly the correct musical pitch. So, um, yeah, that was a lot of effort back then, but uh, it allowed us to get really precision uh, tuning out of it because that was very accurate. And it also freed me up so that Diane and I could go on vacations, you know. <laughs> Not really. We, we, did, uh, we stayed there a lot, watching it. So here's a chart of there are actually, wind chimes seem very simple, right? I mean, we, we had uh, couples come up to us at the uh, New Pulse Art Fair, which we did early on in the 80s. And uh, you remember the, the one couple came up and, and uh, the wife said, honey, buy this for me, buy this. And, and he kept saying, I can make one of those. <laughs> you know, so next year they came back and she bought it because he never, <laughs> Never made it, but it, it does have parts, and where the parts are and the proportions of the parts are really important. Like the thing that said nodal point, that's where it does not vibrate. That, uh, I'll show you. Um, this is one of the original tubes I cut up. You can see this is where the webbing was connected, and you can see that it actually has a good sound, and I'm holding it here. That's the nodal point, that's the pivot point of the waveform. So if I hold it a little bit off of there, uh, yeah. yeah. Now you might think I'm squeezing it and being, no, no, no trick to it. But nobody was doing that back then. So, you know, I did not invent the wind chime, uh, but I think we improved it. Yes. And that was uh, what we intended to do. All right. This is the kind of music I was playing back in the 70s, and uh, we called it unpopular music. <laughs> so uh, our friends were playing popular music, and they were, you know, getting the girls and uh, making money and all that, but. I said, okay, Dave, we, we have to do something a little different. Uh, 
So this is when I started playing with a composer named Steve Reich, who uh, was not that known back then. And now, uh, you know, the New York Times says he's like the most important uh, composer of our time. Uh, fills up Carnegie Hall uh, with performances. Uh, but back then, you couldn't really make a living playing avant-garde percussion. So uh, this is why we started doing wind chimes and, and focusing on, on that for a living while I could still do what I also loved to do. So I was trained in the conservatory as I went to Oberlin College, uh, graduated in 71, in a very radical school, um, but had a wonderful conservatory. So it had that radical element and the conservatory element, uh, learning classical music. I studied with the performers uh, from the Cleveland Orchestra, hoping that someday I'd be in that orchestra or another orchestra. Uh, but here's why I didn't choose that route. Hi, what do you do? I'm a musician. That is so hot. Are you in a band? No, I'm an orchestral percussionist. Percussion, what exactly is that? I play many instruments. I can play snare drum, timpani, bass drum, piatti, suspended cymbal, triangle, tambourine, castanets, woodblock, block and spiel, xylophone, marimba, vibraphone, and drum set. Oh my god, you are a drummer. That is so cool. What is the name of your band? I do not play in a band. I play orchestral percussion with orchestras. Oh, I am much less excited now. So what orchestra do you play in? I have not yet won a job with an orchestra. So are you unemployed? My job is to practice. You are paid to practice? No. I must practice eight hours a day for many years to prepare myself for an audition. You must take many auditions. I take three auditions a year. With the amount you practice, you should take more auditions. There are only about three jobs a year worth auditioning for. Why don't you look for a job in another city? I'm talking about the whole country. I am sorry. Did you say you play the triangle? Yes, I'm quite proficient at playing the triangle. That's funny. I did not know they played people to play the triangle. Yes, I get paid the same as every other musician. What will you do if you do not find a job playing music? I hope to marry a doctor that will support my passion for playing marimba solo literature. And I will teach our children how to play the marimba. It was nice to meet you. I feel sorry for the woman that you will eventually marry. I have no idea who put that together. I, I saw it 15 years ago. They're obviously very connected to the world that I'm connected to. So anyway, uh, there were th several people that influenced me and in, uh, music and making instruments and the, the, uh, the love of uh, ancient musics. Uh, and one of them was Lou Harrison, who had a connection here through Henry Cowell, uh, who is a a really prominent composer um, back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, lived in Shady. He was considered a shady composer. But this is a piece that he wrote called Fugue for Percussion. Uh, the group I started uh, back in the uh, early 70s uh, recorded this. Lou built a lot of instruments and uh, he visited us several times. Uh, it was very encouraging. The other mentor was Harry Parch. Uh, I took this picture maybe five months before he passed away. And um, that's Ben Johnston, uh, another wonderful composer. Harry Parch built literally dozens of huge instruments with uh, ancient uh, tuning systems. And this is one of his operas called The Bewitched, which Unfortunately, you really can't hear because you have to have these gigantic instruments and a tuning system that is really uh, very complicated in a way and simple in another. So this is his book that really inspired me. Uh, it was, um, I think, first written in, uh, the one edition came out in 1949 when I came on the planet at the same time. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I looked at it. I have two copies of this. It's selling on eBay for $400 a piece. So this is why I retired, because I'm going to start selling things like that. <laughs> so this is a, a quick 
uh, explanation of Harry Parch's scale. On the bottom are the 12 notes of the piano, chromatic scale, so the white notes and the black notes. There's 12 of them, and then they repeat. Parch's scale is on the top there, and the reason that you have to have these special notes is because they're notes in between the notes of the piano. You cannot play exactly uh, the ancient scales on the piano, as beautiful an instrument as it is. So this brings us to this instrument called the Vistaphone. It wasn't that long ago that I realized that the interior letters of my last name, Kavistad, spelled Vista. Where was I? I mean, what was I thinking? So anyway, uh, my students wanted to call it the Kavistaphone, and I thought, no, nobody's going to, not many people speak Norwegian, so the Kvistaphone. Um, so I call it the Vistaphone. And we're going to demonstrate something right now. Uh, I'm going to bring Timothy back here. I'm going to first play one note at a time, starting with the lowest note and going up to the top. What's cool about this is that these are the harmonic notes of, say, a vibrating string. If I, uh, one string would play all these at the same time. The strongest sound of that string is the principal tone, or the note we call it whether it be a B flat or an E flat or an F. Uh, so uh, this starts with a low G, and it vibrates at a certain speed. And then the second harmonic vibrates twice as fast as that, the second one. The third one, how many times do you think that vibrates? For the, oh yeah, three times. And then there's a fourth, which vibrates four times as fast. And one special thing about this is that when you play two adjacent notes, it'll play, it'll, put the vibrations of the difference of those two in your ear. It's not in the air, but it reinforces it. So I'll hit the bottom note only once, and you'll see when I go up, it starts getting louder and louder. And it's in your ear.
This is a, a book my physics teacher back in college wrote. Uh, he, uh, I was honored to write the forward for it, but uh, string acoustics were known back in Pythagorean time. Uh, brass instruments uh, during the Renaissance and Baroque period, a lot of research was done about the acoustics of trumpets and other brass instruments. Nobody cared about percussion until a few people started writing about it and, uh, and other groups became known. Uh, a, a fellow named Helmholtz back in the 19th century uh, experimented with a lot of percussion instruments and world music and uh, taught everybody back then that uh, world music was not out of tune, it was just different. And uh, an appreciation came as a result of that. All right, so, how are we doing on time? We got more time left? All right, thank you. So, um, what's happening with this? When uh, the, the low uh, tube is vibrating, and let's say it's vibrating this note, that's an A, seven octaves below A440, the A in the middle, all right? So, that's an octave higher, I just doubled it. I want an octave higher. Now, so, you could keep going with that until uh, those rhythms become a note. And if I uh, kept increasing that until it's A440, you would hear a note that we call A. And when you hear two notes together, uh, like say uh, what we call a perfect fifth, don't leave yet, Diane. I'm, I, this will be interesting any minute, honestly. <laughs> So, she stayed with you this morning. Thank you, man. Okay. I know. I, I taped her feet to the chair. She didn't know that. So, um, the fifth on the scale, so C to G, for instance. Could you sing C to G or A note to fifth? All right. So, that relationship is the top note is vibrating three times for every two times of the lower note, which is. And if I double that, I just brought that pitch up an octave, but if you go faster and faster so that this one is like say 440 or a G would be 392 vibrations per second, you would hear that interval, what he just sang, but together. And let me see, I think I have a demonstration of that. So there are uh, the polyrhythms that relate to one over one is any given note, uh, two over one is an octave higher. This is just blows my mind still that this is the way it works. It, it's, it's so perfect and yet it's so simple and more complicated than I can imagine. Four over three, which is, I learned that in high school from my percussion teacher who wouldn't be able to tell, uh, to teach it the way he taught it back then because it's past the goddamn butter, past the goddamn butter. <laughs> And this is to high school students. So I just did three over two, uh, five over four. If you speed that up, you'll hear a major third. But I do have an example of what I just mentioned. And that same kid, 19-year-old kid, wrote a program for me that I could tap uh, pulses on the computer in different uh, polyrhythms like this. And they would speed up until you heard the, uh, the, uh, the chord, or the two notes as notes. And so I, I think I have four over three here. So you'll hear, and then it'll start going faster and faster until it becomes the interval four over three, like, here comes the bride. <laughs> That's it. Nineteen-year-old kid, and uh, 
he didn't like the uh, Hewlett Packard uh, uh, generator, tone generator, so he built his own uh, in order to do that. Mark Bernard. So, pitch and rhythm, once again, just to illustrate four against three, which you just heard, the top row is play the new dr beat, and the bottom line is play, cool, drum, in the same time period. So, what you're going to hear when it's done together, we're going to demonstrate that you want to come up. We'll demonstrate this. You'll hear play the cool new drum beat. Play the cool new drum beat. Timothy will be the top line, and I will do the bottom line. But we're going to be, uh, help, be helped by the cool new drum beat. Play 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 the cool new drum beat. All right. We can make a living doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So people say, what good are these ancient tuning systems? You know, like the tuning system we use today, and I have an expert here, uh, Richard. Where's Richard Hester? Richard, did you leave already? No, oh, he's somewhere here. He's way in the back. He's hiding. So Richard, uh, I grew up with Richard in Franklin Park, Illinois. His father was the superintendent of public schools. My father was the mayor. So... Uh, <laughs> that's how I got through school. I knew these guys. And that's how we got out of a lot of parking tickets. Anyway, um, Richard also went to Oberlin College and studied uh, piano and also learned how to be a technician with pianos. Uh, and then went and got Fulbrights or a bunch of scholarships to study uh, 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 ancient music, or no, not, uh, Baroque music, uh, Bach uh, times of Mozart, and a certain period where he's building uh, what are called uh, forte pianos. The piano that we have today is called a piano forte. Uh, but back then, the harpsichord kind of played one volume, and uh, the instruments he was interested in, he built many of them, beautiful craftsmen, uh, played uh, uh, forte pianos, so it means loud and soft. And piano today is soft and loud. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> on the piano, uh, there's 12 notes on a piano per octave, right? And there are 88 keys on the piano. So you get a lot of different colors. This music, which is still happening today, uh, you hear a lot of different uh, colors, but they're all based on this pure intonation. The first one is um, uh, Steve Gorn, Luminous Ragas. Just a short example. This is uh, some uh, Gregorian chant, uh, Paul Hillier's Theater of Voices uh, recording. barbershop quartet music. Now uh, there's a thing at the end called the ringing chord. So there's four voices in a quartet, uh, but there is so, they're in tune so well that you hear other voices, a fifth voice. In, in other words, they call the ringing chord. I hear it. <laughs> so uh, here's a little bit of Lou Harrison's American Gamelon music with instruments that he built.
So Lamont Young is uh, credited with being uh, the, the father of minimalism, uh, and uh, he had all these followers. Uh, Steve Reich, the guy I work with, uh, uh, Terry Riley uh, was one of them, and Terry is still working in Northern California, and he uh, tunes the, his uh, electric organ in just intonation. Here's a little sample. Of course, Phil Glass was a member of that group as well. Here's a little taste of uh, the, uh, a piece of Harry Parches called Two Studies on Ancient Scales. The first one is the Olympus scale, which is this scale. It's a Kronos Quartet playing just a very uh, short example. remember her in her uh, previous life as Walter Carlos. He did Switch Down Bach. Uh, it was a really important uh, innovation in electronic music. Wendy has written some really beautiful music and uh, she has one album that talks all about uh, her music and just intonation and different tuning system. First, two short chords in equal temperament. and in perfect tuning. They're both kind of annoying, but the second one is less annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is uh, one of our the largest chimes we made. Uh, and it's tuned to that uh, the, the series of notes from the Space Odyssey. Actually, Richard Strauss wrote those notes. Uh, a piece called Also Sprach Zarathustra. I apologize to people who can actually speak German. <laughs> My pronunciation. Anyway, uh, this is uh, like a, a, what is the original? No, I think it's D, but C, G, C, G, C, G, in uh, five octaves. That's about a five, oct a five uh, foot wind chime. You can call 1 800 4 a chime. <laughs> That's right, we don't own that company anymore, so who cares? <laughs> so that's the end of the show, but we would like to take some questions, and if you could stay, thank you. Timothy, come on up. One more cartoon before we get started. <laughs> so if ancient scales weren't recorded, how did you know what they said? How did they know what they were recorded? That's a really uh, good question. Peter was there, uh, <laughs> and he taught me all these skills. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, there's a lot of uh, writings about the, uh, the notes and the scales, supposedly on uh, vases, and papyrus uh, sheets, and it was preserved that way. We don't know what the ancient music actually sounded like, but we have an idea of what the intervallic relations are, yeah. And they're all handed down in ratios. Sorry, Diane. <laughs> yes? Uh, question for Tim. Can you talk about the difference between overtone singing and throat singing, or are they the same thing? Um, they're, the, they're the same thing. Uh, the, the thing about throat singing uh, that I have a problem with is, uh, as a term is uh, in, in, distinction, in, in, in distinction to what? So as, as I think um, all the singing that I know of comes through the throat. So I call it harmonic singing and a lot of people call it overtone singing. 
and uh, there's a there's a small but crucial difference between overtones and harmonics, but it's it's one of terminology. It's the same phenomenon. All harmonics are overtones, but not all overtones are harmonic. Remember that the next party you go to, it comes up often. Arthur. Yes, your invention over there, what did you call it? Well, the Vista phone? Vista phone, yeah, great. Um, I was so reminded as you were going through that, I have a um, modern, contemporary, I would call it based on a Tibetan singing bowl. It's about 15 inches in diameter, made out of uh, a very special kind of quartz. Right. And when I get a tone from that, it continues for a long time, maybe minutes, really, much as yours did. Now, what, is there any connection? They're both vibrating <laughs> and creating a sound. I'm not sure if you were hearing harmonics or overtones, but uh, the sustain to them has to do with the thickness. So these tubes are a quarter inch thick, so they have a lot of energy and they will persevere. And the same with those bowls, they're about a quarter of an inch they thick are, too. Half inch they're inch. beautiful, oh, even that. Okay, you had a question? Yeah, the Harry Parch uh, fractions and ratios are very odd. Some of them I saw 27, no, 32, 27, so come. What's the scientific rationale? How did he come to them and as diverges from what you were presenting here with the piston? Mm. What, what can we say about Parch and his system? You know, uh, Timothy is a scholar in this area. It would be interesting to hear from you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, let's see, how, how can I put this simply? Um, so, uh, Gary talked about the, the multiplication of the frequency by three, for instance. And that three to two is a perfect fifth. If you continue multiplying by three, you get nine, 27, 81, 243, etc. So those are all going to be perfect fifth relationships. Do, so, re, la, <laughs> like that. And so something like that's why I had him do it. <laughs> so the example that you gave, uh, that's uh, dividing the frequency. So so you would have like Gary gave the example of four over three. And then if you went down a perfect fifth from four over three, you'd have sixteen over nine. If you went down a perfect fifth from that, you'd have thirty-two over twenty-seven. And we can talk about the rest <laughs> later at our leisure. <laughs> Over wine or something. <laughs> yes, Jim. I just have a question for both of you. Um, of all the music that you've heard, I mean, a lot of what you've talked about tonight is sort of like the intellectual side of it. But in the end, when I hear music, you know, there's something that you might know, throw all the overtones out and it just hits me. And there's something I don't know about that little piece you played by Terry Riley. All of a sudden, I felt it, and it, it just did things to me in a funny way. <laughs> and I, I can't find words. We have a doctor in the house. The question is: all the music from, the, from all your history, has there been a music that has really um, touched you, or? And maybe you could put it in the terms of an intonation. Is there playing in a certain intonation that has touched you in a, in a very specific way? You can say, wow, yeah, this is what it's all about. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jim Metzger, uh, Pulse of the Planet. You know his program for so many years, so he knows what he's talking about. Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, but it depends on what age. I mean, I remember getting turned on by different musics, uh, depending on where I was, how old I was. When I first heard Beethoven's symphonies in uh, high school, I was just blown away. I knew that I wanted to be an orchestral percussionist, but you saw the cartoon, yeah. that didn't work. Uh, and then I started hearing world music, uh, gamelan music of Bali, for instance, just uh, took me to another planet, so to speak. Um, uh, other music, well, Terry, Terry Riley's music, for sure. Uh, Steve Reich, then, uh, you know, when I first heard his music back in 1974, 72, or something like that, music for, well, uh, 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 music for 18 musicians uh, was an enormous turning point for me, for sure. How about you? 
I, I, I mean, that my answer would be similar. It's, it's, there's so many different kinds of music that have moved me deeply, that have touched me, that have moved me in another direction. So it, it, the, the answer would, would go on for a very long time. Just a, just a quick follow-up then. Is it the music, the form, or is the intonation play into that in any way? Both, really. And, and also the social context. So I'm like a freshman in, uh, in uh, college in 1967, 68. So you can imagine what that was like to hear the Beatles, uh, you know, like uh, Sgt. Peppers for the very first time. And they weren't into just intonation. They were just into intonation. And uh, it was uh, pivotal for me, for sure. But that was like a social context, too. So, But Duke Ellington said, if it sounds good, it is good, right? So I agree with that. Yeah, way back there. Hey, um, Gary, the, the, um, these are all hung from this nodal point. Yes. Um, you've got the horizontal ones hung from two points. Are they, they have both nodal points? Yeah, it's uh, interesting that the way uh, these uh, percussion instruments vibrate is that uh, they pivot from the nodal point. So if you have, uh, I just happen to have a marimba bar here to demonstrate. <laughs> So you notice there's holes on both ends, and that's at 22.4% of the length of the bar. Uh, and that's the pivot point for the wave, uh, which is just amazing. And I will demonstrate. This is the, that's the fundamental. And the tuner, in which case uh, is a, a company from Belgium, tunes it. So you, here's the first overtone which is two octaves above. And there's no second and third. It goes right up to the fourth one. And then the next one they tune to is, wait a second, I'm holding it in the wrong place. That's like how many tenth, octaves? Tenth harmonic. It's a third, yeah, tenth harmonic. And those are the overtones, but they're harmonic overtones, but they're not all the overtones, but they, add to the beauty of it. But anyway, as far as the nodal point is concerned, uh, the middle is going up and down while the ends are going up and down in opposition to that, which is just amazing. And to get those other notes, it's breaking up into other nodal points uh, for that mode. And so there's three sections for this. The next one, there's four sections and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Bring your friends back and see the museum. It's really a beautiful place.